The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. And I'll be reading from the NRSV. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Please be seated. So throughout seminary and the candidacy process, there is a lot of introspection and evaluation, um, both self-evaluation and others evaluating you. And I graduated in May and I thought I was done. And then I jumped immediately into the call process and was doing interviews and constantly reevaluating everything <laughs> all over again. Um, and with all the interviews and conversations about who you are and what matters to you, um, sometimes I would run out of ways to talk about myself, or I would lose sight of the fun part of me or different parts of me because I was taking the discernment part so seriously. So over the years, I developed this habit of asking people how they would describe me. And usually I would normally only ask the people that I knew closest to me, the people that were my close friends. And I would often get answers like funny or dry humored, easygoing, hockey fan, sloth lover, uh, <laughs> kind of the basic. And then also deeper things. They would also remind me of the things that I forget to talk about about myself or things that I'm not good at saying about myself. Um, things like passionate for justice or my desire to be an empathetic listener or my hope to be a compassionate challenger, someone who is willing to have the difficult conversations to move our community out of our comfort zone and grow. All of those are important aspects of my personality that inform my call to ministry and are the gifts that I feel I bring to ministry and it's good to hear from the people around me also lift those things up. Sometimes though, when I ask this question, there's people who don't know me as well standing nearby, very ready with their opinion of who I am. Um, and from these folks, I usually hear that I am timid and reserved and nurturing and conflict avoidant. And, quote, it's good that I have these traits, you have these traits, because those are the appropriate traits for a lady pastor to have. Um, if you know me at all, uh, those descriptions of me are actually offensive. Um, not that those traits are inherently bad. If you are genuinely a timid, reserved, nurturing, conflict avoided person, you can use those gifts, but th that's not who I am. Um, and then I have also been told that uh, if I'm not gonna be those things, then I need to be exactly like a traditional male pastor. I need to walk into a room, own it, command all of the attention, not let anyone else kind of take over. I need to speak loudly and definitively and be very confident and sure. Um, and that's just not who I am either. And I've actually had this several times, and luckily my friends who were there um, were quick to correct the people who were saying these things about me. Um, I think really it was essentially to save those people from my non-conflict avoidant self. Um, <laughs> but all of this is to say that I will often not meet others' expectations of me, um, as me as a woman, as a pastor, a combination of those, as a human in general. And those people think, may think that I am in some way letting them down 
or that I am causing a problem for them because I don't fit the image that they had of me. I'm sure many of you can relate to these sort of unmet expectations that you didn't know were on you. Um, whether you're a woman who's really into sports or you're a man who really likes sappy movies. Um, you're a teenager who's not living into the expectations you feel your parents have of you. Um, and that's true for teenagers now and all of us who have been teenagers, right? We can all relate to something like that. Um, whether someone has a pre uh, preconceived notion of who you are based on the way you vote or on what football team you root for, um, whatever the case may be, I'm sure you can relate to not living into others' expectations of you. And I'm also sure that you're just as guilty of putting those expectations on others. I have my own preconceived no versions of Raiders fans. I'm sorry if there's any here. <laughs> um, and I constantly have to adjust them and I'm called out on a regular basis by people who both are Raiders fans and are wonderful humans, right? And I'm obviously trying to use a lighthearted example here, um, but there are a ton of ways that we put our own expectations on others um, and others do the same to us. And in our text today, we hear of just that happening. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they respond with very specific answers that they have heard from the crowds. And most of these answers make sense for Jesus' behavior up until now from what we hear in the book of Mark. Um, Elijah, for instance, for first century Jews, was absolutely someone they were expecting to show up back on earth. Um, in Malachi 4, he was raised up into heaven so he never died, and he was promised to be sent back to earth before the end of time. And throughout his life, he was performing miracles, he was speaking to the oppressive powers that be. Elijah absolutely makes sense for who first century Jews would be expecting to be coming from God. It makes sense to see Jesus in this light as the answer to that promise that God had made in Malachi. Uh, we also hear John the Baptist, um, which may seem a little strange because we just heard in Mark 6 that he died, he was killed by Herod. But saying that Jesus is John the Baptist is actually a claim that John the Baptist has been ra raised and that Herod still has reason to fear God. If you don't remember, Herod had John the Baptist killed for his wife and daughter. Um, John was too powerful, he had offended them, he was gaining too much popularity. Um, but Herod also believed that John was a prophet and was speaking for God. And so the possibility that John could be raised again and be present in Jesus meant that Herod still needed to be on guard, still needed to fear God. And next we hear that maybe Jesus is one of the prophets. Um, which again aligns with his performing miracles, his speaking truth to power, and calling out oppression and evil. Um, and this would be seen as a sign of reassurance from God that uh, God was still with Israel even when they didn't have their own kingdom, they were still oppressed. So all three of these possibilities make sense for people uh, of the day to assume about Jesus, but they didn't quite fit. He's something different. So he asks his closest followers, who do you say that I am? And Peter jumps up to say, the Messiah, and he gets it right, kind of. Um, and I wanna be here clear that Peter making this claim sounds normal and obvious to us because we know the end of the story, right? We're living out the story. We are Easter people, we know the full plot. Um, but in Mark, Peter doesn't really have any reason to believe that Jesus is Messiah. Um, and I'll go into that. Does anyone, okay, crowd participation time, get ready. Does anyone know what Messiah or Christos means? Just throw out random guesses. Teacher. Teacher, close. What? Anointed. What was your answer? Savior. Savior. Right. Okay. So, anointed is the literal definition, right? It means one who has been uh, lifted up by God, pointed out, raised up from the others who will act for God. And in Messianic Judaism, that meant that this person would be the savior. This person would restore Israel to their, um, their rightful glory. Um, there's a full expectation that the Messiah will deliver them from whoever their oppressors are at that moment. He will reign as king. He will win wars. He will battle. He will gain wealth. And then he will share that wealth and power with the people of Israel and they will reign over others. Um, and restore Israel to a great place of power and dominion politically and religiously. So, so far in Mark, Jesus has been walking around town to town, walking for miles, hanging out with outcasts, healing, preaching, um, not typical behavior of a future king, a future messiah, a future warlord, essentially. 
So this was a very radical claim that Peter's making. And we haven't heard this word. We hear it once at the beginning to say, this is the story of Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, and I was really tempted to go into a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. This is the story all about how. Sorry. Anyway, um, the point being that this title for Jesus comes out of nowhere. And so far, he has done nothing that would lead an outsider to believe or guess that he was this Messiah sent from God. But Peter does guess this on behalf of all the disciples. He strongly makes this claim, and Jesus says, yes, you got it, now be quiet. Don't tell anyone. And then he starts telling them about how he's going to embody this role as Messiah. They know he is the Christ, but they don't really understand what that actually means for Jesus. Jesus begins to tell him that he has no earthly power. He will face great suffering and be rejected and will die. And yes, he will also rise after three days, but only after great suffering and weakness and loss. And Peter is not having it. That is not the Messiah that Peter signed up for and all the disciples and the Jews were waiting for. It's not how they understood this promise from God. This is not how things were supposed to go down. So like many of us who may be upset at our friends talking about how their day is just gonna be ruined or their life is terrible or whatever, Peter rebukes Jesus. He says, no, that's not how this is gonna happen. He tries to correct and deny what Jesus has foretold. That is not the future that Jesus was supposed to lead to. And Jesus, being annoyed that his friend and follower isn't quite getting it, rebukes him back. He says, no, get behind me. You are thinking of earthly things, not heavenly ones. You are thinking in ways that limit your ability to see the big picture, to see what God is actually doing here. You are actively denying who I am and what I am called to do on this earth because it doesn't fit into your expectations of me, because it's not what you expect from God. This is one of those moments that highlights the vast difference between us and God. Though Jesus is God with us, we cannot shape him or make him into our image, into what we want him to be. Peter would like a savior who is a winner. We too often would like a savior who is a winner and one who makes us winners. We want a God who answers our every desire. We want a God who grants wealth and prosperity and fame and success for our family, for our kids, for our jobs, our churches. We want them to be better than others. We want to be winners. But Jesus instead identifies with the lowliest of losers. He will allow himself to be judged and condemned by religious leaders. He will allow himself to be mocked, tortured, and executed as a criminal by the Romans, the oppressors. So even though we want a winning savior, by our earthly human standards. That's not the story that we're a part of. We are part of a story where our God proclaims good news through resurrection after death and suffering. The Christian story tells us that Jesus was faithful unto death, even while those around him proved faithless, and that God raised him to new life and all of us with him. Because of this, we know that God's life-giving power is far stronger than the worst that human hands can do. Because of this, we know that there is no sin or failure so great that it can actually separate us from the love of God in Christ. This is what Peter didn't get. This is what we often don't get. Jesus' way of being Messiah leads to rejection from earthly standards and earthly bodies. Just because you claim to be Christian um, or say you follow Jesus will not necessarily mean that you're persecuted, especially for those of us who are in predominantly Christian cultures or have political and monetary power. But for those who live into the call of Christ, who take up their cross, who give their life for God, will face objection from the world. To live as Jesus did does not lead to earthly wealth or power. It does not feed into our faulty, any faulty human-made economic and political system. It does not put us above others in any way. It does not set us, it does, I'm sorry, set us apart from the powers that be. It does oppose oppression. It does fight for equity and equality. To take up our cross and live as our authentic God-claimed selves, 
responding to who God is authentically showing us to be in Jesus the best that we can means that we partner with the lowliest of lows, the have-nots, the outcasts, the marginalized, those with strikes against them, as we heard from Pastor Luther last week. Taking up our cross means being willing to suffer the consequences of following Jesus faithfully, whatever those consequences might be. It means putting Jesus' priorities and purposes ahead of our own comfort and security. It means being willing to lose our lives by spending them for others, using our time, our resources, our gifts, our energy, so that others might experience God's love made known in Jesus Christ. We will all at times fail. James reminds us of that in our reading this morning. But siblings in Christ, when you step out of those doors into the rest of God's creation, remember that you have been promised resurrection from earthly fears and worries. And you, you are free to love and give and be with others as Christ has loved and given his life so that he could be with us. I invite you to pray with me. Holy God, thank you for giving your life in Christ for us. Thank you for the promise of resurrection and the freedom that that gives us. Empower us to take up our cross and give our lives for others, putting earthly fears behind us and stepping into the strength and courage your love and peace can offer. In your name we pray. <coughs>